Hi guys, welcome to the Letterboxd wrap up. So we're gonna go through all of the movies, stand up, TV shows, everything that I've watched this month. If you haven't seen my book recap for the last two months, I will have that link down below. I will leave my Letterboxd down below potentially and let's just jump into it. This is the month where I have watched the most movies tied with like two other months this year, but 16. We got through 16. So let's start with the first one that I watched, which was Edge of Tomorrow. This came out in 2014. It has obviously Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt, and I gave this a three out of five stars. It follows Major Bill Cage, is an officer who has never seen a day of combat. When he is unceremoniously demoted and dropped into combat, he is killed within minutes. Managing to take an alpha alien down with him, he awakens back at the beginning of the same day and is forced to fight and die again and again and again. And this was a movie that I watched on a second date with a guy and the date itself was garbage, but the movie was fine. It was fine, but not as good as the next movie, which is one of my favorites of all time, Cabin in the Woods. The Cabin in the Woods came out in 2011. I've talked about this movie a number of times. This will also probably be featured in my Halloween movie recommendations that I'm going to be having mid-September because it's such a meta commentary on horror movies and horror tropes and horror endings, how they always just like fail at the ending. Like this is just, it's such a good movie and it has huge names in it. You've got Kristen Connolly, Jesse Williams, Anna Hutchinson, and Chris Hemsworth before Thor. I give this four out of five stars. This is a movie that I probably watch every six months, if not more than that, because if I ever come across somebody who's like, I really like horror movies, I show them this, and they're probably still like, I don't really like horror movies, but at least I got to watch a movie that I like. So this movie follows five college friends spend the weekend at a remote cabin in the woods where they get more than they bargained for. Together, they must discover the truth behind the cabin in the woods. It's just one of those movies that has more going on than you might first think. I finally watched John Wick Chapter 4. I gave this one four out of five stars. This is the final kind of iteration of the John Wick series, I would guess. Came out this year and it follows John Wick with the price on his head ever increasing. John Wick uncovers the path to defeating the high table, but before he can earn his freedom, he must face off against a new enemy with a powerful alliance across the globe and forces that turn old friends into foe. I really like these movies and this is no exception, but I do find that it is just like cool visuals with the fighting. The story itself is interesting, right? It creates a world around this concept of killers and assassins and like everybody seems to just kind of know that this exists and if they don't then they're definitely not in any of the cities where John Wick is visiting or traveling or at least not in those areas. It's, it's a series that I will happily binge all the way through like once every five years. I watched the Blackening. So this came out in 2022 and it follows a group of black friends reunite for a Juneteenth weekend getaway only to find themselves trapped in a remote cabin with a, with a twisted killer and the most racist board game ever. It's crazy. It is also kind of a more self-aware horror movie. It plays on the tropes of like, well, we can't all die first. <laughs> I gave this a three out of five. It was a fun movie to watch. It wasn't scary or gory. It seemed more like a parody movie to me, honestly, but I don't feel like they fully went either that way or into full on horror. This just didn't hit the mark for me, but I feel like most people acted well. The script wasn't like crazy outrageous. It wasn't like a scary movie kind of movie. You know what I mean? It was like good, chill, watch in the background or watch with friends kind of thing. I watched The Sweetest Thing with my roommates and dude, I used to really like this movie and this made me want to revisit all of the other rom-coms that I liked from like early, early 2000s. This came out in 2002 and you've got Absolute powerhouses, Cameron Diaz, Christina Applegate, and Selma Blair. You also have like Jason Bateman, Thomas Jane. You've got like some early 2000s, 90s, very like popular actors and actresses, right? I fucking hate this movie. This movie is so stupid. I gave this one and a half stars. I don't know what it is with early 2000s movies having a dance sequence and like a song break, but I'm noticing that pattern and may I just say, I hate it, I hate it, okay? Maybe this isn't my era of movie, maybe it's not. I really like like 2009 to like mm, 2017 sort of rom-coms, I think those are really fun. Um, turns out this wasn't it, but I do wanna revisit some of my older favorites. 
um, specifically 10 Things I Hate About You, which I truly don't think won't stand up. I think it'll stand up forever because Heath Ledger and Julia Stiles and you just got everybody who's like amazing in there. But anyways, this movie, okay. Christina's love life is stuck in neutral. After years of avoiding the hazards of a meaningful relationship, one night while club hopping with her girlfriends, she meets Peter, her perfect match. Let me just pause there, okay? How does she find out that Peter is her perfect match, right? She tries to set him up with her friend who just went through a breakup. And Peter says, no, no, can't do it. And she's like, what a fucking asshole, right? Sure. He turns around and they start arguing and she's like, oh my God, a man that didn't give me everything I wanted immediately when I wanted it, whew, swoon. And um, I'm sorry, I hate that also. I hate the trope of like, a guy said no to me, shut up. Like, I love him, let me suck you off right here. Fed up with playing games, she finally gets the courage to let her guard down and follow her heart, only to discover that Peter has suddenly left town. Accompanied by Courtney, she sets out to capture the one that got away. Do you know where he got away to? His wedding. So. He invited her to an after party and then was like, oh, just kidding, gotta go get married. The fuck? But I will say the only part of this movie that I really related to is a guy inviting you to like a party after the club and she just went home and I was like, I feel seen in that moment. I watched Tom Segura, Disgraceful. This is his 2018 special and it just follows a lot of stuff. Musings on porn, parking lot, power struggles, parenthood. Tom Segura is my favorite. He's actually one of my hinge prompts. I'm weirdly attracted to Tom Segura. This one is a three out of five, three and a half out of five for me. But that's also on an elevated Tom Segura scale. They're all five stars, but this one isn't like the top of all of his specials for me. I just want to put that little asterisk in there. Talk to me. I have a full review on this. I will link that down below, but I gave this four out of five stars. When a group of friends discover how to conjure spirits using an embalmed hand, they become hooked on the new thrill until one goes too far and unleashes terrifying supernatural forces. Four out of five stars. There is a sequel in the works because honestly, this is a really cool concept. You can see kind of where the hand has been. I would love an origin story. I'm sure if the second one is popular enough, that might be a thing because I think the origin of the evil hand would be really, really sick to see because you get like a couple words of passing about how it's like an old psychic's hand, but I wanna see that shit. Overall, super fresh movie, very refreshing, uh, kind of like, kind of like Cabin in the Woods where it just doesn't flub the ending. I really like the ending in Cabin in the Woods. I really like the ending in Talk to Me. I feel like so many movies honestly just pussy out and those two didn't. They're like, you know what? We're gonna see this shit through and they did. I watched River Wild and it has husband and wife, Leighton Meester and Adam Brody. And then you also have Taryn Killiam. I gave this two and a half stars and it follows a pair of siblings who love but distrust each other as they embark on a white water rafting trip with a small group one of their friends from childhood turns out to be more dangerous than he appears. I love the setting. I love the setting. I love a forest. I love a river. I love a nature horror movie. And I wouldn't even really call this a horror movie. It's more of a like thriller. I think that there were some really intelligent decisions by some of the people in this movie. And then I think that there were some insane decisions by some of the people in this movie. Acting was good. I just kept thinking though, because Adam Brody and Leighton Meester are married and I'm pretty sure they have like kids together or something, but how weird is that to act the way that he was acting towards her, which was very menacing to your spouse? Maybe it was cathartic, I don't know. But overall, interesting movie, not something that's gonna go on any like best movies of all times, but if you're itching for like a nature-y kind of adventure movie that has a little bit of a thriller twist to it, this isn't bad. I finally watched Megan. Dude, this has been months in the making. I don't know why I just had no interest in this movie at all. Everyone was like, I was watching reviews where people were saying, it's actually way better than I thought it was gonna be. And I was like, yeah, I'm sure it is, fuck off. And then I saw it on Prime and I was like, I mean, what else am I doing? I'm folding a mountain of fucking laundry and I'm replying to emails, so I might as well throw something on. So I threw this on and this is a three and a half star out of five movie, baby. All right, this is not bad. <laughs> It is not bad. In case 
you haven't heard what Megan is about. This came out in 2022 and it follows a brilliant toy company, Robotics, uses artificial intelligence to debate to develop Megan. I was doing so good. A lifelike doll programmed to emotionally bond with her newly orphaned niece. But when the doll's programming works too well, she becomes overly protective of her new friend with terrifying results. And I have heard so many people say that they want a sequel. They want to see where Megan goes. But I'm happy with the one and done, all right? I think this could very easily be a Chucky sort of thing. Anyways, a good movie, refreshing, shouldn't have waited so long, should have listened to the hype, it was really good. Then I watched Bedazzled, this came out in 2000. I gave this two and a half stars, this was also a date movie. Um, different guy, much better date. Meet the Devil, she's giving Elliot seven wishes, but not a chance in hell. But Brendan Fraser, Elizabeth Hurley, and a bunch of other, like I said, 90s aughts actors. So Elliot Richardson, a suicidal techno geek, which by the way, I never got the impression in the like five minutes that you actually see Elliot Richardson that he was suicidal, but okay, go off, is given seven wishes to turn his life around when he meets very seductive Satan. The catch, his soul. Some of his wishes include a seven foot tall basketball star, a rock star, and a hamburger. But as could be expected, the devil puts her own little twist on each of these fantasies. And I mean, it was entertaining. I love a Brennan Fraser movie, all right? He is incredibly talented. And I this made me wanna watch, oh uh, God, what is it called? Blast from the Past. That's what I wanna revisit. I watched that movie constantly when I was a kid and I that's on my watch list now, all right? That movie was awesome. I watched Good on Paper in that same date. This came out in 2021. It is a movie based on Eliza Schlesinger's story that actually happened to her where she fell for somebody who was basically a con artist. So after years of putting her career ahead of love, stand-up comedian Andrea Singer has stumbled upon the perfect guy on paper. He checks all the boxes, but is he everything he appears to be? And I mean, honestly, Eliza Schlesinger and Margaret Cho, when they're together, really, really funny. This dude though, that they cast Ryan Hansen to be the creepy dude, he gives off too many creepy vibes, all right? Like there's no point where I'm just like, yeah, this is an upstanding citizen. Like he just played it too creepy from the get. Like there's no point where I'm like, no, he's definitely telling the truth. <laughs> Like he just gave liar the whole time. So I gave it uh, two and a half stars. This is the second time, time I've seen it. If I saw it the first time, I might rate it higher because like fresh jokes and I would probably laugh a little bit more, but having had seen it, this isn't like a movie that I'm like, hell yeah, I wanna watch that shit over and over and over again. I watched Jared Freed's 37 and Single. This is a new stand-up special that hit Netflix earlier in the month. And he sounds off on the highs and lows of being single at 37 from dating app frustrations to awkward setups to breakup justifications. I really liked his bit on X. Overall, it was background noise for a lot of it. It wasn't like something that I was super tuned into. My cousin and I, the way that we'll watch specials is like, if it's good, we're zoned in. If it's not, we're probably chatting and then we'll be like, oh, that sounds like what he's saying is funny and we'll zone back in. But like the second it loses us, we're like, anyways, how was your day? So two and a half stars. Not something I would watch again, but I would watch something else that he put out because like the concepts were there. It just, it just wasn't like my type of like comedy, you know? I watched Hellfest. Okay. I rated this quite high, all right? I gave this three and a half out of five stars. This came out in 2018. On Halloween night at a horror theme park, a costumed killer begins slaying innocent patrons who believe it's all part of the festivities. And the reason why I liked this movie so much is that everything seemed so authentic. And what I mean by that is like the interactions between the like teens, early 20 year olds who were like the main focus of this movie it seemed authentic, like the awkward flirting and the like friends just like, you know, giving you a little shit. It seemed like it wasn't written by a 50 year old man trying to relate to teens. It seemed like it was written well. And I also really liked the ending of this movie. I just, I liked it. I thought it was great. And I would suggest putting this on your Halloween to watch list. We love a theme park, amusement park, horror park, vibe. And then I watched perhaps the worst movie I have seen all year. That's not true because I've also seen 65 this year. Um, Exists. This came out in 2014. I don't even know where I found this fucking movie, all right? A group of friends venture into remote Texas woods for a party weekend and find themselves stalked by Bigfoot. So 
You know when I said I like wood vibes? This is the exception. I will say their Bigfoot didn't look as bad as I thought it was going to. And there were moments where I could see something on the night vision trip, something, all right? But it was mostly at night and very fucking dark. And I was fucking, my laptop brightness was all the way up. I was under covers, like trying to see something and I could still just see me in the screen. And I was like, this is not what I wanna watch right now, all right? I wanna watch some fuckers get killed by Bigfoot. And alas, I could not. And then last night we watched two comedy specials. We watched Tom Segura Sledgehammer, five out of five stars. This is my fourth time watching it. Okay, ne nothing left to be said there, truly. This came out like two months ago. I've watched it four times. It's a great special. And Michael Shea Matters, 2016. This is an interesting special to watch now because a lot of it is very topical, like that whole election and like a lot of the topical things that were very relevant during that time. But even though it's not quite as relevant now, at least the Trump and like Hillary stuff, this special really like, it fucked. It was really good. I liked it a lot. I gave this four out of five stars. I'm not a big SNL person, so I kind of want to see like what else he's done. Looks like he's done a couple of different things. Seth Rogen's Hilarity for Charity. He's done like a Dave Chappelle sort of thing. He's got Shame the Devil, Bumping Mics. He did a thing. Comedy Central Half Hour. Shame the Devil. When did that one come out? 2021. Okay, so he has a newer one and it's on Netflix. I'm going to add that to the watch list for this month. And then as far as TV goes, it has been shameless. We are currently on season six. We're at the point where Ian is destructive and ruining things with Mickey. And Mickey is a sweet little baby angel who's never done anything wrong in his life. All right. And he's overcoming homophobic upbringings and self-hatred that runs real deep and he is a sweet baby and if anybody says anything about him I'm gonna kick their ass and Carl's a little bad bitch now don't know where that one came from and Debbie is getting to the point where it's like holy holy shit like you hear before you start shameless everyone just being like Debbie's annoying as shit and she started out so good and just wanted to like help her family and she's just fucked Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below. We are so close to a thousand subscribers on this channel. So fucking hit it. And I will see you guys very soon. Bye guys.